Hello, I'm Alexis Winston. And I'm Richard Denson. And as Black History Month comes to a close, welcome to this special edition of Bullet Broadcast. Over 67 years and four months ago, there was what former Oklahoma State President David J. Smidley called an ugly mark on Oklahoma State University and college football. It was the Johnny Bright incident. Occurring on October 20th, 1951, it featured Oklahoma State, back then known as Oklahoma A&M College, playing Drake University in a college football game. But this was no ordinary college football game. In fact, two years prior, Drake quarterback and running back Johnny Bright made history as the first African-American football player to ever play at Lewis Field, the name of what is now called Boom Pickens Stadium. Although that game went without an incident and Drake lost, being the times it was, it was an open secret that it rubbed many on the team the wrong way, and they looked to take him out the next time around. So fast forward about two years, and Drake is once again playing Oklahoma A&M. This time, though, Bright is entering the game the leading nation in total offense, and he's a preseason Heisman Trophy candidate. But the Ocali, which was back then known as the Daily O'Collegian, and the Stillwater News Press knew Bright was a marked man, as several students openly claimed that Bright would not be around at the end of the game. So in the first seven minutes of the game, Bright was knocked unconscious three times by blows from defensive tackle Will Banks Smith. It seemed as Banks had taken on the role of the hitman, as he had some history and qualms with Drake players. In a matchup in Des Moines the year before between Drake and A&M, a Drake player had injured an Aggie player in what Smith deemed a dirty play. Yeah. And so Banks started the game by exacting revenge on that player First, during the opening kickoff, he sent a forearm straight into that player's clavicle. A Caucasian player, no call from the referees. They continued to play ball. Now he moved his attention to Bright. Bright was a tough guy. In fact, his teammates called him the Great Black Flash. So he took those hits and kept coming. But it was the third hit. It was that hit that, captured, that was captured in a sequence of six photos that basically put him out for the count. So let's break down this sequence. On the first photo, it shows Bright, number 43, handing the ball off to his fullback. Okay, no harm, no foul. It's normal right now. Smith is basically rushing him uncovered as the offensive lineman can only guard one man at a time. On to the second photo, we see Bright has completely given the ball away to the fullback, and it seems as the rest of the defense knows this, but Smith still has his eyes set on Bright. On to the third photo, Bright is well behind the play and watching the blockers create a hole for his fullback. But Smith is still locked on Bright, and you can see his arms cocked. On to the fourth photo, now this is where you really start to see what's going to happen. Bright is definitely out of the play, and everyone is essentially up the field except Bright, Smith and Smith's fellow defensive lineman, and number 29 of Drake. But literally everyone except Smith has their eyes up the field on the fullback running. Now to the fifth photo. This is where you see Smith start to initiate the action. Everyone has their eyes on the play, but Smith is prepared to deck an inattentive Bright. And then to the sixth, sixth and final photo, boom! Smith clocks Bright right in the jaw with his elbow. That final photo is perfect evidence that the whole play was a dirty play from the jump for Smith on Bright because back there the play is over, it's done with. The action is now up the field. Why even touch the quarterback? Nobody else did. They were focused on getting the fullback. And Bright's draw was broken on that play. He was taken out immediately. But as we said earlier, Richard, he's a tough player. So a few plays later, he came back in, completed a 61-yard touchdown pass to his halfback. But the damage, it had been done already. The pain was so much, the injury forced him out of the game. He finished with less than 100 yards for the first time in his three-year collegiate career. And then would go on to win 27-14. Mission accomplished. Yeah, Des Moines Register cameraman John Robinson and Don Yultang, they captured the six photo sequence. And with all the pregame storylines going into the game, they had their cameras focused on Johnny Bright. So they kind of knew what to expect. The two men rushed the film back to Des Moines so it could make the cover of the newspaper the next day. And in fact, that whole sequence won them the 1952 Pulitzer Prize for photography. Eventually, that whole photo sequence made it to the cover of Life magazine, and it basically spread like a wildfire. But for the two teams on the field, it was immediate silence. Bright would go on to finish the season earning 70% of Drake's yards gain and points, despite missing the better part of the last three games. He played in Drake's postseason bowl game as well as the senior game, but his effect had been limited because of the incident. He finished, he finished fifth in the Heisman uh, voting. 
Oklahoma A&M's president, Oliver Willem, denied anything happened, even after evidence of the incident was published nationwide. This charade would continue for decades. Every time the story was discussed, the response was no comment. Realizing that neither Oklahoma A&M nor the Missouri Valley Conference would inflict disciplinary action to Smith or the team for what occurred, Drake withdrew from the conference in protest after the season. The Bulldogs would not return to the MVC until 1956 for non-football sports and would not return for football until 1971. But Drake wasn't the only university. Bradley University also withdrew from the league in solidarity with Drake. It did not return for non-football sports until 1955, and its football team never played another down in the MVC. As for Wilbank Smith, the lineman who hit Bright, he became a polarizing figure. Many praised him for hitting Bright and putting him away, even going so far as saying that he should have run for office in Louisiana. Many flooded him with hate mail and death threats as well. News reporters gave him every outlet to apologize, but he never did because he felt he did nothing wrong. Still to this very day, Wilbank Smith has never apologized. Johnny Bright died in 1983, and he went to the grave without an apology. 22 years after his death is when David J. Smithley, OSU's president at the time, finally issued a formal apology. In a letter written to Drake's president at the time, David Maxwell, Schmidley said, I was pleased we could th thoughtfully discuss the 1951 Johnny Bright incident. The incident was an ugly mark on Oklahoma State University in college football, and we regret the harm it caused Johnny Bright, your university, and many others. Now, you know what they say, better late than never, but Alexis, what do you believe it, why do you believe it took 54 years before OSU could finally acknowledge the situation and apologize for it? Apologize for it? Just because of the time it happened in. At the time where racial tensions were high, they probably really thought they didn't do anything wrong. It was football, um, and we'll talk about this later, or like roughing the passer penalties weren't really in play, and if they, if they were leaked, if they were in the rule books, they weren't really enforced. And also, we're in the South. Well, o people, people say Oklahoma's in the Midwest, but I mean, we're in the South. So like, let's be real. They're not, gonna, they're, they're, they're not gonna apologize for that because it's what they want to see. But just look at the impact it did. You basically, I mean, 10 years later, uh, Ernie Davis, I think was his name, he would go on to become the first African-American to win the Heisman. But that, that's crazy to know that Bright could have been the one if this incident didn't happen because he was basically hot. He was red hot. He was almost unstoppable. And it's just crazy that this whole incident not only tampered his career at the time, but it also uh, tampered his career going forward because he could have been looked at more in a more positive light than essentially being a martyr for getting hit like that that hard. So it's just crazy that mm -hmm. it took them so long to apologize and just the effect that it really had on Bright. But looking back at the incident, you might look at how much it changed college football forever. While what Smith did was definitely not legal, the penalty for flagrantly rough play or unsportsmanlike conduct was a mere 15 yards. After this incident, the penalty was 15 yards and the player was ejected and suspended. Face masks were not mandatory in those days and most players, including Bright, did not have one. So that's probably why the, the hit hurt more. That wasn't the case after this incident as they were now mandatory. In fact, following the 1961 season, the rules committee recommended that all players wear properly fitted mouth protectors. And in 1973, the mouthpiece became an official part of the uniform for players. And nowadays you'll see in college football, if players lose their helmet, they have to leave for a play. And even though concussions still remain an issue in sports, not just football, there are actual protocols that are in place, unlike back then when, when Bright was playing. It's safe to say he had a concussion in that game, and he kept playing when he definitely shouldn't have been so. Also nowadays, you see dirty plays like that draw way more scrutiny. Now, Richard, look in the NFL. Rob Gronkowski drew heavy scrutiny for the dirty hit he laid on Bill Shadarius White. He got suspended, and he was fined for that. And we all know about Vontaze Burfix and Dominican Sue, two other players who are known for making plays that draw a lot of scrutiny and can be classified as dirty. Teams and leagues are less tolerant of those types of players and plays, and the steps definitely have been taken to ensure a deed like what Smith, that what Smith did doesn't go unpunished. Looking at this event, you see a lot of comparisons to other events in black history, and that was in part because of those Pulitzer Prize winning photos. Because you had photos that actually showed what happened, that illustrated the scene. 
the violence, the impact. You can't help but think of the Emmett Till incident in 1955, the photos of his corpse after he was lynched in Mississippi, the pictures of black children sprayed by police utilizing Birmingham's water cannons in 1963, the lunch counter sit-ins of the 1960s, James Meredith crawling for dear life after being shot during a march for black voter registration. You see all these incidents, and even though this is sports, you have to put the Johnny Bright incident up there with those incidents. You're right, and another thing they all have in common is that they're martyrs. Now, our Bright's incident didn't kill him. You can make a case that he became a martyr because of all the changes he sparked in sports. Three years before Bright died, he said this, what I like about the whole deal now and what I'm smug enough to say is that getting a broken jaw has somehow made college athletics better. It made the NCAA take a hard look and clean up some things that were bad, end quote. I mean, I think, like you said, you, you're the one who actually brought to my attention that he could be a martyr in this, in this retrospect. So can you explain that? I would just like to think he's a martyr because, like I was talking about earlier, it took him getting hit, this incident happening, and them not, like, even though A&M brushed it under the rug, Drake stood behind him, and then you have Bradley that stood behind him because they felt that this incident was wrong. And then you have those two cameramen who wanted to show the people what happened because of the times it was, the civil rights movement. So Bright essentially made a sacrifice for us to not only clean up our act out in the government and in the normal world, but clean up our act in sports. Because yeah, you have Jackie Robinson who broke the color barrier. And yeah, you have Jesse Owens who wins medals and stuff. But in college football, you really hadn't had an incident like that. And Johnny Bright essentially, even though he probably wouldn't have wanted to be put in that position, I think he went to the grave knowing that this situation happened for a reason. So you could clean up college football, clean up the sport, because football is a dirty sport. You have people who now are afraid to have their children play yep. because you talk about concussions and how dangerous they Big can deal. be. Yep. But as Black History Month draws to a close, we'd like to take a look at some of our personal favorite sports heroes of the civil rights movement. Richard, it's been a really good talk, really informative. I hope the viewers can actually learn something. But one thing that I did want to mention is that we talked about earlier how some students, they before the game even started, they knew Bright was a marked man. I actually went through the original um, Ocali, the Ocali articles that were written before and after the game. And after the hit, to my surprise, a lot of students in their letters to the editor actually were standing behind Drake and um, Bright. They were saying, yes, people wanted him to be hurt. They had heard the rumors that, um, that the team, they, they, they had a target on them. But they also acknowledged the fact that it was dirty and they loved football more than they, more than they hated, basically, the black man, which is something that I was, I was really shocked to hear. I was really shocked to read that they actually took his side after this hit saying, yes, college football needs to be cleaned up. And if someone really chooses the side of race relations over football, then they're not true fans. That's incredible. Just saying, like he was talking about the, the South that it was. Yeah, it's not Mississippi, it's not Georgia, it's not Alabama, but still Oklahoma's the South and being the times it was for even this school to be a predominantly Caucasian school, predominantly white, whichever way you want to call it, for them to still stand behind Bright, a black man, that just speaks volumes for the character of people and the fact that people can still grow and realize the moral thing. So I think that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And as while this incident, like the pro old president said, it is a, an ugly mark on OSU's on OSU's history. They also had some good things come from it. So I think a double -edged sword. I think more than an ugly mark, it might be that, but it's also a learning mark. So it's something that we definitely look back and we examine and we be like, dang, we've we've definitely come so far. No. It's still work to be done in today's to society, <laughs> but we have taken steps. And while we continue to take steps outside the football field, it showed, this incident shows that we definitely have taken steps on the football field. You're right. Well, we thank you guys for joining us today. Again, I'm Alexis. I'm Richard. 
And this has been a special edition of Bullet. <laughs>